hear anything, let me know. Yeah. I just set that up. We should be good now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so my name is Matt. I was going to try to come in person and also for not another reason now I'm, I'm uh, sick. So I'm not COVID sick. I have a cold, so probably better that I'm not there with you anyway. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk to you guys today about birding around Chicago and Northwest Indiana. Um, and currently just some credentials. My background right now is that I'm president of the Illinois Ornithological Society. And I'm also a board member on the Dunes Calumet Audubon Society. So I'm actually on two two different state uh, boards right now. And so, yeah, like uh, like I was introduced, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually from Grand Rapids originally. Um, and so uh, I've been in Chicago since 2013, but I've had a lot of other jobs like educator, zookeeper, uh, research technician. I worked at John Ball Zoo. Um, you can see at the bottom there, I, I put some of the places that I went to school. <laughs> even went to zoo school, City High, uh, Northern Michigan, Central Michigan. And then I also worked at Notre Dame for a couple of years as a research technician uh, in their environmental research center. So that's what the ERC part of UND ERC is there under. Um, and that's a split between working on campus and also working in Northern Wisconsin and uh, the Upper Peninsula there, which is where I got my life for, I think, evening grow speaks when I was working up there. So that was pretty cool. Um, before I talk about some of the birding um, places, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the organizations in the area. And so, like I said, I'm going to talk about Chicago and Northwest Indiana. They kind of, there's some places that are, you know, pretty cool in both sections and a lot of people kind of go between the two. Um, and so I want to talk about the organizations in both just to give you the landscape of what it's like around here. Um, so there's a couple of state organizations. So like I said, I'm in charge of or president of IOS, the Illinois Ornithological Society, um, which uh, the distinction for us is that we're more the state records. We house the state records committee. Uh, we do field reports. We publish the sort of like official state journal of a lot of the data and new, and new uh, articles about like, you know, state firsts, things like that. Um, some of the research articles from our grants that we give out. Um, and then we also house the Young Birder Program. So the Young Birder Program is under us. Um, it was started under us and not the Illinois Audubon Society for the state. So there is an Illinois Audubon Society too for the state. So we're kind of a weird state because we have two state organizations. Most states don't, um, but they do have local chapters too. So Lake and Cook counties are the counties that are, Cook, Cook is what Chicago is in and Lake is just above it. So the Audubon chapter of Illinois, the state chapter is uh, right there. Um, and their biggest distinction is that they own a lot more land than any of us. So we, we, none of the other organizations, we're all member organizations, but we're not really landowners and Illinois Audubon is. And they, and they have uh, land where they have prairie chickens in the, part, in the middle part of the state. So that's actually one of the big cool places to go visit. There's also the Chicago Audubon Society. Uh, their distinction would be that they're the ones that house the Chicago bird collision monitors. And so what that is, is it's a group that goes around downtown Chicago during the height of uh, spring and fall migration. And they're looking for birds that have hit buildings um, and hopefully, you know, ones that are not deceased, they can bring to rehabbers and ones that are, uh, they collect data on everything. And then they bring the ones that are deceased to the field museum. So the field museum has a large collection of birds, unfortunately, a large collection of birds uh, from the, that program. Um, and what's really great about that program is that even if it's not um, during migration, or if you just find a bird, you can actually still call them in the city and they'll still help maybe pick up a bird and get it to a rehabber. So you don't have to do that. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's a great program. It's been going on for a long, long time there. Um, and then a new program last year was that the Audubon Society spearheaded this birdwalk leader training program. Um, and so even though it's a really big city, you tend to get a lot of the same people doing walks and leading walks. And so we were trying to train more people you know, for a number of reasons to increase diversity of people that are leading walks, uh, you know, trying to get some bilingual walks, um, trying to get walks in different parts of the city that we hadn't really reached yet and trying to get people from those those areas. And then also just increasing the number of people willing to lead uh, like walks. And so all of the chapters kind of like contributed by being speakers, but Chicago Audubon really led that effort. And then Chicago Ornithological Society, another pretty old organization in the city, um, also a member organization, lead, you know, they do walks and events, similar things, but they have a couple conservation projects. And so one of them is Labaw Woods on the Northwest side of Chicago. Uh, uh, and so what they're doing in that particular project is that uh, generally, 
you know, when we volunteer, maybe people have done this, you volunteer to kind of take out invasive species, something like buckthorn. Um, people do that in a lot of places. And so Laba was one of the places they were doing this, which is a forest preserve district. Um, and so they were taking out all the invasive species, but no one was really like putting anything back. So then it kind of leaves that, that open for maybe some of those things to come back in. And so what uh, Chicago Ornithological Society did was raise a bunch of money to actually start uh, planting plants back in place of buckthorn and the things that were being removed. And that effort's been going on for several years now. I think last year, the year before they planted their like 1000th shrub in the, in the, in the woods there. Um, and so that's been a really great ongoing project uh, that they've been working on. And now they've sort of started working in the Calumet region, which I'll talk about a little bit later what Calumet region really is. Um, but there's a couple big parks down there uh, by, that are owned by the parks district. And so they've been able to establish a bird banding station and also a modus tower, which is the first one that we have in Chicago. So up until now, we had no modus towers in Chicago, which are the towers that will track birds that are specially tagged as they, they get close or you know, migrate past those towers. And then we can get data on birds moving by. Um, so those are some Chicago area organizations to, to follow. So a lot of them have you know, presence, uh, presence on social media, Website. So those are good places to look for information um, if you're coming to the area. And then, like I said, I want to cover Northwest Indiana a little bit too. That's some really great places, especially if you're driving down from Grand Rapids, you're going to go right through this, that region too. Um, there's two main organizations I was going to highlight. So there's the, the Indiana Audubon Society. So much more traditional one state organization, uh, Indiana Audubon Society, state records. They have the Young Birders. They have research and education grants. Um, trips and events, and then the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival. So I have a little plug for that at the end. Um, but that's something that's about, I think, six, seven years now has been going on, and it's, it's really pretty fun, and I'm, I've been involved with. And then the other organization that's more regional to the Northwest Indiana section is the Dunes Calumet Audubon Society, which is the more traditional uh, chapter of National Audubon. You know, it, I'm not sure if that's how Grand Rapids operates, but yeah, that's the one where you get like members sent to you from national, you get some pot of money from national to operate. And then uh, you just kind of have programs and things. And so we're, you know, much smaller. So I'm on the board of that uh, Audubon society. And so it's a much smaller group, but we do some monitoring projects like great blue heron nesting um, areas around here, starting to work on looking at shorebird monitoring and, and doing some awareness at especially parks like Gary, um, where they actually have really good be like beaches. Um, but we're trying to help them clean them up and, and talk more about shorebirds. And then at the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival, we do have a native plant sale. And that's that's been a really big hit, actually. It's been, you know, high demand at that, that event for those for those native plants. <coughs> Sorry. So what I want to talk about first is Chicago area birding spots. <coughs> so if you've heard of anything of Chicago, anything about Chicago birding, you've probably heard of Montrose. So I'm gonna just start right in on there so that we can talk about that. But then I wanna cover some of the Chicago lakefront and then what a lot of the birders call the Calumet region um, and, and a couple spots down there. So if you're, going, if you're going to Chicago, maybe you're going on a family trip or whatever, Montrose Point would probably be like the one place you'd probably wanna to try to stop if you couldn't get anywhere else especially during migration, spring and fall, those are the peak times to visit. It's the migratory bird trap. Um, and it's just this little mixed bit of habitat that sticks out into the lake. And so it's up here and I'll go back just one if you can see my arrow here. So downtown Chicago is like where like Millennium Park and stuff is down here. So it's probably about three, four miles north of downtown. And so it's just this little bit of a, piece of land that sticks out into the lake. And just that little bit of land, 15 acres, they've had 350 plus probably species observed there. Um, some real rarities, Cass and Sparrow, Ancient Merlet, I uh, got that a couple years ago, Townsend's Warbler, Frigate Bird, Wandering Tattler, all sorts of stuff. And then a lot of regular current species. So it's like the place to go to see pretty much anything, any Sparrow, any Warbler, any Warbler, even marsh birds, there's enough habitat there for like literally anything. And it's a, such a small area and it's really easily uh, covered by most anybody that it's just, it's probably the ultimate spot to go. 
And part of the reason is uh, in the 50s, there's this little hedge, almost nothing that was planted when the army was leasing the land. And that's now considered what we call the magic hedge. Um, and it's honeysuckle. So unfortunately, not a, not a great species of shrub to be there. But, be, you know, once that was established uh, in the 80s, the parks districts took it back. They were starting to restore the land. Um, and so now you have this really nice mix of habitat because the parks district has been um, working on it. Um, the nice other new feature is that there's this really new paved trail um, that's very accessible. So for anyone that, um, if that's a consideration, this is a great spot to bring anybody. Um, and street parking is pretty easy. So I wanted to include some of these other logistics in case like people get worried. You know, I know Chicago can feel daunting. I know when I grew up, especially Grand Rapids visiting Chicago, all we ever did was go downtown. And I tr trust me, like if you get away from downtown, it is not as crazy to drive around and park and, and find things. So Montrose is actually pretty easy to get to. Um, you can kind of see it in this, maybe this little bit of white here. There's a road right, right along uh, where the sanctuary is. It's street parking. It is now, unfortunately, paid street parking. They just changed that this year. But very easy to get to as long as there's no events or anything happening. And so this is the aerial view. Um, and just to orient you, so like to the left here would be downtown Chicago. Um, but this is the road. I know it's a little blurry, but the road kind of runs right here. And that's where you would park. And the entrance to the sanctuary is like right, right in here. So it's actually very easy to get to. And then you can see here this sort of big uh, prairie area to the left that kind of pokes out into the lake. And then over to the right, this whole area here is more of a wetland complex. So there's sort of like this wetland complex and then a little bit of upland dune uh, habitat where, you know, during migration, you get like short-eared owls, Lacan sparrow, Nelson sparrow, um, you know, anything you can think of, the prairie area, you know, think like Dick Sissel, Savannah Sparrow, you know, all those kinds of things. And then the wetland area down here would be great for any sort of like marsh birds and, um, you know, even shorebirds along right, like Lake Michigan. And then the interior here, the main part, the hedge, the magic hedge is basically right in here. Uh, the magic hedge and all that area is great for warblers. And so I was pretty dubious when I first moved here because all I ever heard was Montrose. I was like, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's good, but like, is it really that great? And it really is like, like I, you know, if you want photo ops of literally like every warbler, this is a great place to go because there's, you could stand in front of one bush and see 15 species of warbler bopping around one tree. I mean, it just really is the density of birds is, is just so great compared to like really anywhere else I've visited. Um, I haven't been to Taos Point though. So that's a place that's on my list to get to. So I don't know how it compares to there, but but here is just, it's really easy to get to. It's really, you know, a lot of birders are there. So that's another great advantage is that there's people there helping you point things out, helping you learn, helping you um, find birds. So, you know, people usually get their Connecticut warblers there. You know, they're really skulky hard things. That's, that's a good place to go to get them. And this is the new entrance. So you can see it's just really nice paved path. Uh, there's no bikes, there's no dogs, there's no other you know, things like that allowed in there. So it's just a really easy going uh, place to go. This is sort of a typical day, you know, at Montrose, a bunch of people staring into the magic hedge here to the right. Um, and if you went further down the path behind all these people, that would be the entrance. So we're kind of looking back down towards the entrance. This is before the paved path. So now this would all be paved, this whole area, if you visited it today. Um, and I don't know what they're looking at, probably some warblers or something. This is more as you start getting out into that dune area. So this is what it would sort of look like. And then behind them is Lake Michigan here. And then the really kind of wet area and everything is kind of further out down there. Um, now we're looking sort of back at Montrose. So Montrose is here. Um, and all, a lot of this is pretty accessible. So you can kind of walk around most of it. You can kind of walk along the shore there's some, there's a few little, you can almost see it here. There's a few little like sandy, kind of those typical lakeshore trails um, going through there. Um, and so, yeah, this is pretty good habitat. And, and if you're familiar at all with, oh, I forgot to mention on that first page, but uh, Chicago piping clovers, uh, the, the Monte and Rose story, this is the area where they were actually nesting. So they were nesting like right in here the first year, which at that time was a volleyball court. Um, but has since been converted into uh, land that is now just a part of the sanctuary. So the Parks District was able to 
fence it off. They move the volleyball courts away. And so now there's even more uh, great habitat for birds. And then there's even a colony of bank swallows that uh, at, beyond that light post back there that you can pretty much stand. There's a little spot on the path. You can stand right next to the, the colony. They don't really care. Another great photo op sort of place to go where you can just see these bank swallows kind of flying in and out like constantly in the spring and the summer. This is looking out more towards Lake Michigan. This, I think this was a day where either the lake was, you know, sashing or was pushed further. It was not usually this much water connecting into here. It's usually more of a sandbar here, but yeah, this is this whole area that is all basically accessible. The water's not so high. You can kind of walk along the edge. So you can easily spend a whole day at Montrose if you're, you know, trying to, to really build your Chicago or Illinois list. I just took a quick screenshot of what was on eBird of like all the, the media. I mean, there's really no specific species to go for at Montrose. It's just a migrant, it's a migrant trap, but it's a really good one. Um, and you can see here some really hard birds to see like Canada warbler up on the left, uh, king rail. There was a king rail that hung out for like a week and it just kept walking around out in the open and people got to see it, you know, really close up and got a lot of great photos, yellow breasted chat, uh, hooded warbler, you know, all these really great species. I know piping plover is not probably as big of a deal for Michigan folks, but, you know, piping plover, that's another one that a lot of people like to see, especially in Kirtland's warbler up in the right there. So all sorts of great birds show up at Montrose. So, and I will say if there's any questions, if you're like online, uh, feel free to type them in. I'm pretty good at monitoring questions in there, but um, I can even take questions at the end about any of these locations um, for people in the room. So that's Montrose. I mean, it, it's like the place to go. Um, the other place that if you're up that way is Bill Jarvis Bird, a migratory bird sanctuary. So it's another location that's really easy, kind of an easy quick stop away from the city, not, not so daunting. Um, and so it's just south of Montrose, just a little bit. Here we go. There we go. Uh, so it's just south of Montrose a little bit. Um, and it's basically just this little tiny patch, six and a half acres, but it's got about 243 species that have been recorded there. Um, and in the core of it is fenced. So you just kind of this place where you kind of either walk around or you just sit on this elevated bird viewing platform, which is also a fairly accessible uh, place to go. The trail is kind of a hard pack dirt. It's not, it's not paved, um, but it is pretty easy. And it's a short walk, very short walk from the parking lot. And I've led trips out there and our trips out there really just are standing on the platform and watching things flying by. So you don't even really have to walk that much to find birds there. Um, but you can take the short trail around. It's, it's, it's not long at all. Um, and this is another spot that has metered parking. Um, this is, you'll find out there's a couple different apps. If you want to go into that detail, feel free to ask me at the end, but there are some apps that make it easy to deal with parking if you're in Chicago. And this is a parks district lot, which is different than Montrose, which is like the city parking on the street, um, but still very easy to park right, right close by. And this is what it basically looks like. I was trying to find a non blurry picture and it kept blurring, but this is the platform. So you just stand on this platform. There's even some like bird graphics and things here. This is the fenced in area. And then there's a path that goes all the way around that. So we basically, in the spring and fall, just stand here with groups and wait for birds to fly by. And then this is the path from the parking lot. So you can see it's kind of like this hard dirt, um, but, the, but the platform's just a little ways down, super easy to get to. Um, you know, even in the winter this time of year, things like long-eared owls sometimes are along the lake shore and some of the, this, uh, I don't know what kinds of trees are, maybe pine trees there, I think they're jack pine. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely good birds to see year round, even at this location, if you're not there during spring and fall. Okay. So here's another Chicago lakefront park that I'll fully admit I have, I don't bird that much, but I wanted to point it out because a lot of people do that are on this side of town is Jackson park and it's South of downtown. So now we're downtown is North by probably eight miles or something. It's pretty far North. So this would be like, if you were coming in from the South and then if you can see this little yellow line along the corner there, that's, that's the toll road. So if you were taking the toll road into Chicago, you weren't far from where Jackson Park is. Um, and this is a great park too, because it's just a mix of different habitats. Um, it's even includes like just regular park space and golf course and everything. And I'll show you an aerial view. 
but it's much larger. So it's 543 acres, over 300 species, um, but still gets good rarities, black rail, Townsend's warbler, brewer sparrow, and then all of your typical migrants because it's a mix of, you know, habitats. And the cool thing about Jackson Park, it's really old. So like it was created for the Columbian Exposition in 1893. And, and the Museum of Science and Industry is on the north end of the park, which is also a building that was, I think, part of that Columbian Exposition. So it's a cool park to go. Maybe if you're going with family and they don't really want a bird and you want to try to like work in some other aspect to get them to go, you can have you and bring the Museum of Science and Industry and drop them off and walk around. Um, there's some other cool features like a Japanese garden in this park. And it will be apparently the location of the Obama Library. That was a little bit of a a, a sticking point for some people. They didn't really think it needed to be in a park, but the Obama Library will be there eventually in, in Jackson Park. Nice thing about this park, once again, paved paths. So it's another great spot um, and there's metered parking there. So once again, pretty easy to, to just park and walk and not have to worry too much about, you know, like woodland trails or where you're gonna leave your car or anything. Like it's it's really easy to get to. And, and it, honestly, the driving down there is probably ever a pain unless it's like shopper. So this is Jackson Park. So you can see far to the back, that's Chicago, way, way back there. So like I said, you're about probably eight miles away. I don't know, I could be overestimating. Um, but then this whole big section here is a golf course that actually extends far to the right and down a little bit. Um, that's also possibly gonna become like a Tiger Woods golf course. I don't know, that's something that's been a little bit of a, a local battle, but uh, no one really birds. I don't think the golf course, most of the birding is up here. So really you're just concentrating on this area and mostly this little part here called the wooded Island. So it's pretty cool. There's a parking lot right at the base of it. You take a little path, you take a bridge, and then you just, you just walk around this paved path all the way around. Um, and it's really easy birding, you know, everything from, you know, your, your regular land birds to water birds. Cause you have that water around there. And then on the far North end of the park is the museum of science and industry. Um, so sometimes you can kind of park up behind there and walk a little bit in some of the areas up there. And then over immediately to the right, there is another beach with a few little areas to visit right here. Uh, kind of the claim to fame to this little beach house uh, that's kind of a part of Jackson Park is that they have a lot of cliff swallows that nest like up on the building. So it's a really nice place to, to go see like cliff swallows kind of up close. And then this is the walk. So once you've left the parking lot, you just go over this bridge and then you're on to the wooded islands. You're surrounded by water, um, but it's all really nice, easy paths, easy place to bird. So those are sort of like the two, I would say like city highlights. If you were like in downtown and doing things in downtown, maybe with family and you wanted to get away for a little bit, those are both really easy spots to get to by like lift, bus, uh, you know, anything, just driving yourself. So I would, you know, those are the two places I would recommend if you're kind of like just visiting Chicago for a little bit. If you're, if you're like driving through there, driving back, Calumet region can be a great place to kind of stop by and check too. Um, and so Calumet region, I'll give you kind of the broad definition, but then I'll tell you kind of what we birders were refer referenced. So Calumet region, if you go to, if you type it in, if you're looking at like Field Museum, this is from the Field Museum website, they actually include a good portion of Chicago. So just to orient you, this whole yellow spot to the left, that's all the south side of Chicago. And then basically the entire Indiana lakefront all the way up into like, must be like New Buffalo. So really that is what is called the Calumet region. I think that's an older, um, from older sets of maps. Uh, I think it came from a term that they think in French meant like, lakes and streams and so it was just maybe this this complex of wetlands which is what it would have been back then so it makes sense um but i would say in terms of birding like most people in chicago and indiana when we say the calumet region we generally are referring to more south chicago and then parts of northwest indiana which is where i am and where i live um, and this is just a more clear example of that that outline so you can kind of see uh, what what are some of the places that are in there? So Gary's kind of in there. Hammond is where I actually technically live, uh, but I work in Chicago, so I sort of commute back and forth. Um, and then you can see the dunes. The shore is all included, but for the most part, like birders, if we're talking about the dunes, we say the dunes. If we're talking about Calumet region, we're talking about this this left more westerly portion. 
And so there's a lot of places and I didn't, you know, they're all going to be similar birds and, you know, maybe different things that you could see at them. Um, but so I didn't want to touch on all of them necessarily just because, uh, you know, there, it was going to be kind of like the same thing over and over, but there's several places you could visit. So you could visit the state park down here. This is the part of Wolf Lake, which actually extends over into Indiana. Once again, if you've taken the toll road, you've probably driven right through it. So if you ever remember getting close to Chicago and all of a sudden going, oh my gosh, there's water on both sides of me. And then you see like a bunch of swans and things that was probably Wolf Lake. That's right here. And they're probably mostly mute swans. You do occasionally get other things. Um, surprisingly, actually just a little bit to the, to the East here, this is a little lake called George Lake. You can get all like trumpeter, tundra and mute all at the same time in this area over here. Um, this time of year, actually, all three swans will be present, but not usually in Wolf Lake. It's kind of weird. Uh, so Wolf Lake would be a place to kind of visit. This is the one spot, if you follow the trails up to the to the kind of south edge of Eggers Grove, which they kind of blend into each other. This is the one area where people consistently get bobwhite quail. It seems like it's either some tiny little spot where they're dispersing to, could be that someone released them. But for years and years now, we've had bobwhite quail, just a few hanging out in this area. So it's something that is kind of interesting. And so, you know, if you're a crazy lister person like I am sometimes, that's your spot to go to get your bobwhite quail for, you know, Chicago and uh, that whole region. You can also, of course, visit Wolf Lake on the Indiana side. So on the Indiana side, there is a park here, Forsyth Park, which is a nice typical open park, easy to drive through, easy to walk. Um, you can definitely just view the lake in a few spots with barely getting out of your car, but you could also walk the whole place and, and check for migrants. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the typical kind of place that you would probably expect to be along like a lake like that. And then there's also a nice little shorebird spot down here that's a little harder to find. So that wouldn't be someplace I necessarily recommend people going, but you can actually walk underneath the toll road and, and park and there's a cool shorebird spot down there. Indian Ridge, Hegewish Park. These are both wetland uh, parks on the Illinois side that are that can be interesting. Um, Indian Ridge has been a spot where you get a nice mix of waterfowl, shorebirds. Um, mockingbirds have now started to seem like they're hanging out more in these regions down here, which obviously those are that's a species that's been pushing more north. Um, Hegewish Park, uh, right now for us, that's one of the two places where uh, all of us in the Chicago region kind of check for like common gallinule. So they've been nesting down there, but then they've also been nesting up that big marsh park, which is actually the one I wanted to talk about more because it's newer and growing and there's been uh, things established there. Big marsh park is also the park when I was talking about the Chicago Ornithological Society, that's where they've now established the Modus Tower, the banding station. Um, they do some shorebird monitoring, especially like, at, or not shorebird, uh, marsh bird monitoring. So like at night they go out and listen for, for marsh birds. Um, so they've been doing a lot of work in big marsh. And Big Marsh is right nestled down here, um, you know, south of Chicago here. Uh, this whole area to the left, you're probably seeing all this water and you're like, oh, that'd be cool to check out. You, can, you can't really get to a lot of it. Uh, it's sort of blocked off Army Corps of Engineers. You can go to the golf course and look in, but Big Marsh is your better bet in that area to, to go birding. And so if you zoom in on Big Marsh, this is why it's so cool is that they just keep adding more and more trails. And so all these black lines are the trails that exist now all on the south end of the park. And when I first moved here, this was like pretty much a totally inaccessible piece of land. Like people would drive along the road to the left here uh, and just kind of look in to see what they could see. But now you can drive in, you can park, you can, you can walk all over. And there's about 247 species there. It's about 300 acres, but that's including everything. So that's much smaller the portion that you'd be able to access right now. And uh, like I said, it's a good place for like common gallon wool, Virginia rail, Sora, trumpeter swan, even American white pelicans. We're getting, we think they might even be nesting over in Lake Calumet, but no one can really get over there. Um, and then least bittern nests in this uh, big expanse of park too. Uh, and then maybe some of the other like more rare rails are starting to move in. Every once in a while during the spring, we'll get like a King rail either at like Hegoish or here calling, but we don't know if they're staying and actually breeding. Um, so these can be really good places to check, especially in the spring. Um, also, it's got a brand new nature center. It's got a BMX bike park. So another great place if you're if you have kids that you need to occupy while you want to go birding, this is a great place to go. Uh, 
The trails here are gravel though. So there's like a few paved trails, but it's definitely, and they put down new gravel. So I'm hoping it'll settle, but it wasn't exactly the easy stuff to walk on last time I was there. And in the future, if you're not coming, you know, if you visit in a few years, there's going to be a lot more trails. So all these red trails to the North, they're going to add bridges, more trails. So, you know, pretty, pretty accessible from Chicago. If you're driving through great place to stop and sort of check out some wildlife. And it has, I'm going to put this one in quotations that it has metered parking because it's such a far out of the way park. It's, it's a park district lot. I'm not, I'm not going to condone it, but you could get away with maybe not quite like paying if you just stop real quick and like walk around for an hour. Like it's, it's just not really a lot that they've established yet. Cause it's kind of far and out of the way, but, uh, but there is a lot of cool stuff like right down by the parking lot. Um, that'll show you here in a second. Uh, so this is sort of the overview of the park. Uh, this is one of the trails that runs all the way kind of around the perimeter. And then on the interior, you can kind of see these dirt trails. Those are actually the BMX bike trails. So you wouldn't go in there. You would walk the scrabble trail around the edge. Um, and then somewhere over here is like a nice viewing area into the, the main part here. And I, oh yeah, it's not on this one, but yeah. So here's the parking lot coming in from the road. This is that Lake Calumet area that's really not accessible. You can't get to it. You, you can kind of see a fence there along the, the road, but the Pelicans do eventually kind of like wander over and wander back. So it's a good spot to see them. And then you can see uh, this bike park all down in here. You can even see all these little jumps down here in the far left corner. This is like storage, uh, storage containers and things down here in the left. So it's, you know, a cool spot for, for kids to come to that like biking. Um, this is one of the viewing spots where you can kind of check and see what's out there. You know, black crown night herons. Last year, there was a yellow crown night heron that hung out here for a while. Snowy egrets have started to seem like they're kind of making a comeback in the area. Like we've seen as many as two or three or four together uh, between here and the Indiana side. So some of these like birds we think of as being a little further south, they're starting to make their way back up into these regions. And then this is the nature, the environmental center. So another big advantage of going here is that of course, modern bathrooms, really nice space inside to get out of the weather if it's hot or cold. Um, and there's some great graphics inside that talk about the region, the history, the birds, there's some mounts, uh, there's some things in there to, to check out. So really cool environmental center that you could go check out too while you're there. And I had to throw in one picture of the, the BMX bike park so you could just see how fun and interesting it is. So this is actually the, this is what it looks like and it gets really busy. So like when we've been there in the morning, no one is there, but if we're birding for a long time, eventually all these kids and people show up with their bikes and that's, that's a, actually a big part of the usage of the park now. Okay. Uh, so now I wanna talk a little bit about Northwest Indiana because there are some really cool spots in Northwest Indiana to check out. I feel like particularly Gary, you know, gets a bad rap, but there are some cool, cool places around Gary to check out. And then I tried to pick a couple of spots that would be pretty unique that maybe they're birds that maybe you would get further north, but would be a little bit harder, or not as easy to find. And so the first place I want to talk about is a kind of the furthest south spot I'm going to talk about today, which is the Kankakee Sands Nature Preserve. Uh, this is actually owned by the Nature Conservancy. Most of the land in that area down in this is um, and it's Newton County, Indiana. So it's way down here, far south, almost to Morocco here. Um, in this little blow up, you can see a place called Conrad Station, Savannah, Kankakee Sands Bison Viewing. This is kind of the main area you would go to, the main parking lot. And then Willow Slough, which is actually DNR property, butts right up to it. So this whole area is really nice to, to explore, but a lot of it is just driving birding. So you're not really gonna sit and bird too much, except for maybe at the viewing areas. And then one other trail that I'll mention, but it's 240 species. Uh, it's 8,400 acres, probably really like 10 to 20,000 if you added up everything else that's kind of butting up to it. There's bison there, so there's a huge bison area, so that's fun besides birds. Uh, there's there's cool bird, cool mammals to see. Um, but this is like, I think the best place, I don't know if there's any place like this in Michigan really or anywhere else in our area, but you can see Henslow Sparrow, Dick Sissel, Lark Sparrow, 
Blue Grove Speak, Bell's Vireo, Northern Bob White are like everywhere. Grasshopper Spares are like everywhere. Um, so this is a great place to come like during the summer. So really like after you've done all your migration birding, make a trip down there like in June um, and you'll, you can get all of these birds. And I'm sure there are places where you could pick up a Henslow Sparrow or two probably in Michigan or even up like further up by me. But down there, it's like you're driving down the road and you're just hearing them singing everywhere. Like it is like the one of the strongholds for the population down there. And so that's a great place to go. Lots of opportunities to get good, fo good photos of them, too. Um, but like I said, it's mostly birding by driving. There is one trail, though, that I would recommend. And I'll show you on the map, the Grace Taninga Trail. And that has a mowed path. So it's a grassland where they just mow a path through it. Um, it's not gravel or wood chipped or anything. So ticks, that's one thing to think about. Um, and so this is the, that whole area. Um, if you wanted to visit, I have my, I'll, and I'll just put this in now, I have my contact information at the end. So if you ever want to visit any of these places, you have questions too, you can always email me. Um, but the Grace Taninga Trail is up here where it says B. This is this little trail up here. And that's some of the best places to just walk around and just get photos of like, uh, Dick Sissel and uh, grasshopper sparrows and Henslow sparrows and everything else that hangs out like in, in grassland areas. And then driving is just basically driving all these roads, maybe stopping at these parking lots and walking around along the road a little bit. Um, and then the bison viewing areas are further south along the property. They're down here off of 41. Um, so yeah, this is a great great place to explore in the summer. So I'd highly recommend in the winter, uh, you know, last winter I bought a group out here and we had probably 15 rough-legged hawks. Uh, if you go in the evening, you can get short-eared owls. I mean, I've heard of people getting as many as 11 or 12 short-eared owls down here. So, I mean, it's a great place to kind of visit in like non-peak times when you're trying to bird other areas, you know. Yeah, so this is kind of like, I think the Grace Tuning a lot where this is like a little bit of a mode path. Um, but yeah, a lot of the birds are very obliging, you know, sometimes they'll fly away, but eventually you'll get a Dixisil to kind of just sit there or a, you know, grasshopper sparrow. This one was grabbing a whole bunch of food. So I assume it was going to feed something. Um, and even just right along the road, you'll see all sorts of different things. Uh, Henslow sparrow, lark sparrow. And then there's this uh, six line racer species of uh, lizard that seemed to be quite common in a lot of places, especially at the bison viewing areas too. So another non birds species that's kind of fun to see. Uh, and then I've also been told that, ooh, I can't remember, there's a bull snake, a bull snake in this area, which is kind of a cool herp for people that like herps too. So that's Kankakee Sands. I would highly recommend that. That's a great place to go. Um, and then this is probably the other kind of like really weird niche place to bird is Miller Beach and Marquette Park. And so if you zoom in, it's right here where this green arrow is, and you zoom in, it's kind of just this regular old park, but it's right along the southernmost edge of Lake Michigan. And so the reason that birders go there is to get their, like, all their migratory cool gull type birds. And so there's about 295 species observed, but really what people do is they go there late summer and fall to just sit and watch for waterfowl, gulls, and Jaegers, and terns. And so you can, of course, get Jaegers along the sides of the lake in a lot of places, but they seem to all funnel down right to this spot. And so what you have to do, unfortunately, usually, is go on like a cold, windy day when the wind is blowing in your face, and those Jaegers will get blown closer to shore. And so there are days where they'll get like 15, 20 Jaegers like flying by. And so that's sort of like that area's claim to fame. Of course, you can still bird this area. There's, there's a wooded area. This is a national park area right here to the south. Um, and you can walk the beach for other kinds of shorebirds and things. But people really go there just to like park and look for those Jaegers and gulls. And so that's kind of what it looks like when you're out there. There's two main la locations. There's one here on the beach. And this would be Lake Street Beach if you were looking on a map. Um, and like I said, you know, people are looking for those cool specialty things like Jaeger, like parasitic Jaeger or a black leg kitty wake or a Sabin's gull, something like that. Lots of turns come by, usually in the hundreds, you get commons and foresters turns. Um, and then the other spot is by this concession stand, which actually now looks different. This, this setup is, I couldn't find a newer picture, but this is a, 
what people kind of use as a windbreak. So if you're getting wind coming real hard, people will either be standing on one side or the other side trying to get out of the wind. But yeah, scope probably necessary if you're gonna come do this kind of birding. A lot of people have their scope and their camera on a tripod ready to go. Um, but yeah, this is kind of what it looks like. You're just standing around with a bunch of people hanging out waiting for something cool to fly by. And then there's the Indiana Dunes area. So the Indiana Dunes area is kind of unique because it's a mix of like state and national park. Um, and it spans actually a lot of counties. It's really spread out. Um, and I'll show you a map in a second. But overall, it's like over 300 species, 15,000 acres, 50 miles of trails. Uh, some of the best areas to go are places that are called Beverly Shores, Heron Rookery, Coles Bog, even though it looks like Cowles, it's pronounced Coles apparently, West Beach, Miller Woods, and I'm gonna to touch on a few of those. And so this is what it looks like if you looked at the whole map. So it's really, really big area. Um, there's even a spot here that's way, way out called Pinhook Bog, which is actual authentic bog. Coles Bog is actually not an authentic bog. It's just a wetland, but it's called a Coles Bog. But Pinhook is, and it's fenced off, um, and you can only go into the bog portion of it with a ranger, but you can visit it, and it can be pretty good sometimes for uh, good migratory uh, warblers. But I'm going to focus more on the middle here. So just to orient you again, Marquette Park's way over here to the left. So this is what we were just talking about, Marquette Park. Some of that national park land actually wraps around that area too, but I wanna focus kind of more on this area for the dunes area to highlight a couple places that would be cool to go. And so in here is where you have that Indiana Dunes State Park, this light green kind of nestled right in among the national park, which is all the darker green stuff. And so I'm gonna talk about that separate um, and as an FYI, it would be like a separate fee. So Indiana Dunes State Park is a separate entrance, like a regular state park from the national park. So that can be confusing to people if you come to visit, is that even if you have a national park pass, that's separate because it's a state park. Coles Bog Trail, which is over here, which like I said, is actually a wetland. So don't get your hopes up if you're looking for an actual bog. Um, and then Heron Rookery, I'll kind of touch on, which is kind of this interesting little shorter walk over here to the right. So Indiana Dunes State Park, like I said, separate from the national park, but it's probably the best one spot to go. If you're gonna not, not actually go to like the, the national park, I'd say go to the state park because it has a nice nature center with feeders. Last year, a lot of those cool finches were coming and stopping by like evening gross beaks and stuff. Um, there's a lot of cool trails. There's prothonotary warblers that nest in there. There's this brand new boardwalk. Uh, on what's called Trail 2 that kind of goes through this big wetland area that's really cool. So Indiana Dunes State Park is probably the better place to go for like one stop and just walk around all the trails. Plus you can get to the, the lake shore from there. The other place I would definitely recommend if you're gonna go to that area is Coles Bog, which is a part of the national park. Has one really great trail. It's about two and a half miles around the whole swamp or like wetland area, whatever you wanna call it. It's really diverse habitat, though, still beyond that. Like there's upland oak savanna habitat, um, which is great for like pileated woodpecker. Redheaded woodpeckers are really common. A lot of the national park and state park areas down here, all those open oak savanna areas. Uh, and then least bittern, Virginia rail, red shouldered hawk. The trail that I'm standing on taking this picture from, you can kind of see down into the wetland. And this is where I've gotten some of my best looks and best photos of like Virginia rail. Uh, Sora, all those kind of secretive marsh birds because they kind of walk in between all of these open and, and kind of vegetated areas. So it can be a great place to sit and wait for those kinds of birds. So that's a great place to go. What I heard right now, it's like not really regulated. They don't, they don't have like people at all these parking lots, but I think pretty soon they will. So just be aware that you might probably would have to have a national park pass if you came to visit. Here in Rookery is the same thing. Just kind of this little out of the way place. It was that one that was far off to the right. Um, not really regulated right now, but they might eventually have someone hanging out there. But it's a great spring birding destination. It's one long trail. Um, and despite the name, it seems like everything's misnamed. Uh, there's no herons there. So there's no herons actually nesting there anymore. Um, but this is the one spot where I usually go for like slam dunk, Louisiana water thrush, yellow throated warbler, uh, some of those species that maybe don't quite aren't quite as common in a lot of other areas in the region, 
So those are the two that I usually target when I'm there. But then things like cuckoos, barred owl, um, you know, any of any of the warblers really in spring, this can be great. Connecticut warbler now has become like, I should have put that on the list. This has been a great place for Connecticut warbler and migration. So this can be another really great place to get that Connecticut warbler. And then the last place away from the dunes is Jasper Pulaski. And I just wanted to put a plug in for this because I think it's a cool natural phenomena. You know, the species diversity is not very high. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'll show you in a second. But Jasper Pulaski is down here, uh, kind of in between what's called like North Judson. Uh, I can't remember exactly the town that's actually in. Um, but it's Indiana DNR property. There are other species there, 221 species. But really, the reason people go is because it's like the stopover for sandhill cranes. And then you do get a few other things in there, like whooping crane, golden eagles have been overwintering now the last few years there. And then last year, we got common crane, which was like, you know, an extremely rare bird for the whole United States uh, that was with this big flock of sandhills. And so when you go there, it's just like, you go there in the evening, so you don't have to get there real early and you just wait for all the cranes to sort of show up. And the best time to go is pretty much right now, like November to December is when the cranes peak and they can get over 30,000. Um, so it's just a fun place to see all these birds hanging out. And so there's even this um, place that you can stop and sort of look uh, out into the field where they all come in in the evening. Uh, and then this is what it would kind of look like. So you just see all of these cranes. So like I said, I know that sandhill cranes aren't particularly rare. People see them, especially when I'm visiting, home visiting, we get them you know, in the backyard at my in-laws, but you don't see them in these numbers. Like it's just so amazing to see 30,000 cranes coming in. And then eventually you cross your fingers and you hope to find something like a whooping crane mixed in. I think last week people said they had five whooping cranes hanging out with the sandhill cranes. So this is one of your best bets to try to get one of those whooping cranes that are obviously from the population up in Wisconsin that get tagged and everything. And then this was the last numbers that I found on the DNR website. So you can actually track when the best time to go is. And you can see November 23rd, 28,000 cranes hanging out there. Um, and so it took a while. They were slow migrating, but now they've really picked up. And so last year, it looks like December 1st, so right around this week, would be when they peaked at about 30,000 down there. So a really fun place to go just for the phenomena. And also another cool place to go when it's not peak birding time. You know, you kind of can maybe take a weekend trip or something down and, and visit and see all the cranes coming in um, down at Jasper Pulaski. So those are it for like all the birding spots. So like I said, if people have questions about them or specific, you know, other things that they want to know about, let me know. And uh, I'll, I'll definitely try to answer questions, but I wanted to plug a couple of things that are coming up that maybe they might be a little bit of a drive, but you might be interested in. Um, one is that we always do like this goal event um, and it's with Amar, Ayash, if you know who that is. Um, Amar Ayash is like probably one of the what, most well-known gull, gull people. So he's been organizing this for years. It's at North Point Marina, which is north of Chicago. So you'd have to drive all the way up and around. But basically he gets out there, he starts throwing bread out. He gets all these gulls to come in. And then basically you can just learn from Amar how to tell all these things apart. So if it's hard for you to pick out an Iceland gull and a Glaucus gull or a lesser black bat gull or whatever, they almost all come in uh, during this event. And then we have a speaker and everything. So you can register uh, at the link I included. It's about $35 for non-members. And that includes continental breakfast, a lunch, uh, the the uh, speaker fees and everything that we have. So it's a pretty fun event. Uh, it's limited to about 150 people. So I think we're at least halfway there last time I checked. But something to consider. I know it's a long drive from Grand Rapids, but it would be kind of fun if you had nothing else to do that weekend. And then the other thing I was going to plug that uh, I usually end up helping out with and leading a lot of trips for is Indiana Dunes Birding Festival. So that's May 12th through the 15th this year. Um, it's at kind of all over the Indiana Dunes, but the Indiana Dunes National Park Visitor Center is where the home base is. Um, and it's hosted by the Indiana Audubon Society. And I put the link there. I don't think it's all, we're pretty early yet, so it's not all up and running yet, but this is the logo for this year. So every year there's a new logo. Actually, I'm wearing like, I think a couple of years old logo here. Uh, but the Indiana Dunes Festival has the piping plover as like our bird of the year on here. And then there's usually a fine art print as well. So it's a really fun event. It, it spans usually all the all the areas that I just talked about and more. So it's a good way to get to know the area. And then you usually have a lot of good guides that will help you find stuff. 
Um, and the nice thing about having all those eyes out all at the same time is we tend to find, you know, whatever cool rarities might be hanging out in the area. And if you wanted to look up even more stuff, I would, I would look at these two resources. So the Indiana Birding Trail is really great for information about all those locations I talked about and more. And then this guide is a little older. I put a, these are both links. Um, so maybe we can include them somewhere. Um, but they're, the, the Chicago one's a little older, but it still has great information about places to go find different kinds of birds and how to get there and everything. So both of these would be great things to look up if you were trying to like plan a trip down here. And then that's all I really have. So you can, uh, you know, I post pictures of these places I'm going or talk about them on, you know, Instagram and Twitter. If you ever need to plan a trip and you want to ask me, you can, you can send me an email. I also will usually guide trips for, and I should have put it on here, uh, Red Hill Birding, which is uh, my friend's company. Um, and then I also like lead trips for Indiana Audubon and everybody else, basically anyone who asks. So um, that's my talk. And if you have any questions, let me know. You can go ahead and put them in the chat or ask them in the room, I guess. I'll stop sharing here. Any questions for Matt? Uh, someone wanted to know if the Chicagoland birding, what was it? Booklet. Booklet is still available. It's about 30 pages. No, I have some sort of, I have some sort of Chicago land birding book on my shelf somewhere that I found and picked up at like a used bookstore, but I don't know if there's any sort of booklet that's still available. I think the, everything's mostly online now, like that guide. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, there's some chat there. Uh, Tom Leggett just pointed, just uh, dropped a hint that uh, uh, when birding Indiana, a carbon window mounted scope is really a, it's a must. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really, I know, I, I don't have one yet, and that's something I still need to get. I was actually, I was at Muskegon Wastewater for the couple of days that I ran up. Uh, during Thanksgiving to visit family. I wish I had one for that because I kept jumping out of the car. So I, I feel like that's something I want to get soon. I was down with the, in college with the biology club to uh, Indiana. I think we didn't go to Jasper Plaza. We were going to a wolf facility. But uh, we thought we saw what looked like a massive slow tornado. And when we put binoculars on it, it was sandhill cranes taking off from a field, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Just yeah. No. Yeah, and even if you don't go in the evening, if you if you're down in that area during the day, they're usually feeding in all of the agricultural fields nearby. So they'll eat kind of like spent grain and like whatever invertebrates and uh, even vertebrates if they can find you know mice or something running around, um, they'll eat them. But apparently, like they'll just spread out through that whole region, and so you can drive around and really find a lot of cool birds. And that's how we were trying to find the common crane last fall when someone had seen it. They will pick up every once in a while and move. And so everyone's just driving everywhere. And at one point, I think a golden eagle scared them. And then we that basically is what happened is they just took off. And then just in the air, it's like probably 10,000 or something flying over you all at once, which is really crazy. Uh, Mary's asking, she says she has relatives living near the Algonquin slash Fox River area. Anyone good place, any one good place to bird there? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't make it out that far very often, but if you email me, I definitely, I'll try to, I'll find someone that knows. And I see that there's another question further up about uh, like outings. Yeah, like pretty much all of the organizations I talked about, including uh, iOS has outings. So anyone can usually attend any of them. I don't think any of our groups are ever exclusive about members or anything. So I would look up any of those, any of those groups that I talked about. Um, I think Dunes Calumet, we have one this weekend, just kind of going to some of the lakefront places around here. Um, and anyone's always welcome to those. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, it's tough to decide between Maggie Marsh, McGee Marsh and Chicago. I know. So honestly, I, I've been I've been trying to really make the push to get people like I know McGee Marsh is really cool, too. 
but Indiana dunes, Montrose, you, you can really get a great experience just from those places too. So, uh, yeah, if you want a new place to try, I would try one of those in the spring. And I think you won't be disappointed. I, you know, it's a good question. I, I haven't been to McGee Marsh, but I've heard the boardwalk there can be very crowded. Um, and I think Montrose can be very crowded, but at the same time, it's probably easier to get around because it's sort of like a trail system as opposed to like getting locked onto a boardwalk or stuck in a boardwalk with people. Um, and Indiana Dunes is big, really big. So it's generally less crowded, but you do have more people just kind of walking through. A lot of people use that as a place to run or just do their daily walks and things. So it can be a little bit crowded that way. Um, but yeah, lots of great places to explore. <laughs> Sold. I do a uh, May warbler trip to Bering to Bering County, actually. So, if you're going to check for field trips on our uh, on there, maybe you could meet us there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bering County is a good. Yeah, I haven't. That's another place I have personally need to explore more. Uh, I've been trying to get up there a little bit more often. I get a lot of rarities at New Buffalo for some reason, but it's you know something just randomly shows up there. Or at Tiscornia Park, the the uh, pier of Grant at uh, Benton Harbor. Yeah, I think I think both groups on days when they're monitoring the lake, like the Indiana group and the the Tiscornia people, try to communicate a little about things when they're flying by. <laughs> I think that ancient muralette a couple of years ago, it flew by Tiscornia and then flew by Indiana like an hour later. So they kind of like knew it was coming in a way. There had been one up at uh, all the way up at Ludington that I went up for, but uh, it wasn't there when I got there. Mm. So maybe it went to Tuscany. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another interesting species. I don't know about the rest of the state, but uh, that nor that southwest corner of Michigan and then into the dunes is worm eating warbler. So it's a species that can be probably hard to get a lot of other places, but it seems like Van Buren County. Uh, I think Warren Dunes, there's some places where you can get war worm eating warbler. And then also in Indiana Dunes State Park, they've been there the last few years too. I've had them in uh, Warren Dunes a number of times. And mm -hmm. I've had them in the Allegan State game area and once at uh, Saugatuck Dunes State Park. So they're around, but the farther south you get, the more than there are probably. <laughs> yeah. And even they're pretty, they're pretty sparse by us, but you have to get far south Indiana and Illinois to really see, but, but it seems like they like that because they like hilly areas. So it seems like the dunes areas seem to be the places they, they kind of stay. Okay. Any further questions? A uh, bunch of people are saying, thanks for a great program. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks. And like I said, feel free to email me, you know, whatever I'll, I'll do my best to help you if you want to come down and visit. So. I would also point to say that if you uh, are married to a non-birder, Chicago is an easier sell than a lot of other places. <laughs> yeah, that's totally true. Yeah. And even like the dunes area, there's a lot of like wineries. You, I mean, you guys know Southwest Michigan wineries, breweries, things like that too, that you can go visit that are really nice to, and, and Chicago itself, same place. If you're that kind of person, a lot of great, great places like that to visit too. So. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks very much, Matt. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We will uh, close up in a few minutes. Anybody see?